This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never put it out. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. There is good news to tell, so let us worship the living God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, on this resurrection day, you gave death the slip and rose to new life. The tomb could not hold you, nor could our limited lives and imagination. You not only rose from the dead, but also came back to us. You not only kicked open the door of your tomb, but also forced open the closed doors of our hearts. You came back to us, spoke to us, empowered us to be witnesses. This is our great hope in life and in death, that you will continue to overcome our doubts, that you will keep kicking open our locked doors, that you will come to us and show us your glory, making every day of our lives an Easter. Amen. Proof of God's amazing love is this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. 
In faith and penitence, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let us pray together. Living God, we confess that we look for the living among the dead. You send Jesus on ahead of us, but we stay behind, studying the tomb. You reveal to us your heavenly glory, but we set our minds on earthly things. Forgive us, give us new life. Send us forth to share the gospel with our words and deeds, proclaiming the life that death cannot destroy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. And so friends, believe this good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. It's a real joy to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to this celebration of the resurrection. Uh, we're delighted that you are here and would invite you to please sign our friendship roster, pass it along, get yourselves acquainted to anyone sitting nearby you. I want to uh, offer a special word of welcome to Case Jonas who probably has come the furthest distance to be part of our Easter uh, celebration. Uh, Case Jonas is in our, our partner church. There's Case, there, Jonas. <laughs> our partner church in Ethiopia, and he's here to be part of the Ethiopian network, and we welcome you to in here. So. A special word of thanks as well to uh, Brookie Phillips and Gretchen Rush and their team of decorators who helped create our sanctuary so beautifully uh, this morning. And also just want to uh, say a special word of thanks to our choir and to all our musicians, not only for uh, today's music, but for, for all that you've done throughout this whole Holy Week. It's been a very uh, special time and we're really grateful for that. There's much information in the bulletin for you to read. One of the gifts we offer you on Easter is there are no announcements, so uh, uh, please uh, read them. We do welcome you in the name of Jesus and look forward to a rich time of worshiping and praising God together on this Easter Sunday. would invite any of the elementary age children to come forward now for uh, children's message with Todd. Um, I wanted to say that I love Easter, and I love Easter baskets, and I love Easter egg hunts, and I love Easter candy, and I especially like trying to guess what might be inside eggs. So hold on, hold on. I think this one maybe sounds like jelly beans. So that's in that one um, let's see but as fun as it is to get Easter baskets and hunt eggs that's not really what Easter is all about um, Easter and I, and I wonder what's in this one Easter is about 
Jesus. You see, God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to live among people, uh, to be an example for us and to teach us how to live God's way. Um, but that's not all Jesus did. Jesus came to take away our sin. And so sin keeps people from having a friendship with God. And God loved us so much that he didn't want us to be apart from him. Um, that's the real meaning of Easter. So Jesus allowed himself to be killed. And through dying, he made it possible for our sins to be taken away, to be forgiven. So Jesus died, and his friends took him down from the cross, and they laid his body in a tomb, which was like a, like a cave. And they rolled a big stone in front of the, the entrance to the tomb. And all Jesus' disciples were very sad. They thought that that was the end of Jesus. They thought it was the end of Jesus for good. But the story didn't end there either. You see, on the first um, day of the week, on Easter Sunday morning, some ladies came to visit the tomb. And they were surprised to find that the tomb was empty. And that the stone in front of the tomb was rolled away and Jesus was not inside. Jesus was alive. And so what I've done this morning was a trick. Uh, but what happened on that first Easter Sunday morning was a miracle, an amazing miracle. Jesus was alive. And so not only um, was the tomb empty, but um, there was an angel that appeared. And the angel said that, that they shouldn't look where dead people should be found because Jesus was alive. So they saw an angel, and then even better than seeing an angel, uh, Mary and many others saw Jesus alive. They saw him in person, just like I see you um, right here this morning. Um, so Jesus is alive, and that's why we celebrate today. Um, today on Easter Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus is alive. Every Sunday, we celebrate that Jesus is alive and that we can be forgiven for our sins, all right? Um, so if kids, if, if you would join me in prayer and congregation, um, join along with us in prayer. Dear God, Dear God. Hallelujah. hallelujah, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And, because Jesus died and because Jesus died and came back to life, back to life. Our, sins our sins can be taken away and we can live with you forever. Amen. All right. Thank you all very much for coming and joining me this morning. Okay. Thank you so much. You may go back to your seats or after We Ones Worship, and let's spend a bit of time uh, welcoming each other in the name of Christ.
The Easter story this year is taken from John's Gospel. This is the 20th chapter, the first 18 verses. Listen to the word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb and the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples return to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my God and to your God. The picture on the bulletin cover today raised some eyebrows in the church office this week. For Easter, that's the cover? Where are the lilies? The sunrise by the shore, the trumpets with hallelujahs blaring. Don't you want something a little more traditional? I suggested, what's more traditional than this? Now, you may know Matthias Grunewald's Isenheim altarpiece and its depiction of the crucifixion. This is, we use this this week in our uh, Stations of the Cross guided meditation. And, and also on that bullet and cover. And this is my favorite picture of the crucifixion because it depicts the pain of the cross and Jesus' woundedness and, and his suffering. It depicts that so powerfully. I actually had this picture uh, hanging in my college dorm room, which uh, le leads my wife to say when she discovers these kinds of things about me, you really were one odd kid, weren't you? <laughs> that picture in your dorm room? Well, on, on Easter, this altar piece was open. It flipped open to reveal the resurrection image that you see here in the bulletin, which presents the 
greatest possible contrast between the crucified Christ and the risen Christ. Christ is, is literally exploding from the tomb in the middle of the night, you know, accompanied by the, a blinding light that seemed to radiate from his own transformed countenance. This picture reminds me that if there is anything we can say about the resurrection, it is that it was totally unexpected. Sunrises and lilies and springtime flowers are simply not adequate images for Easter because they are expected, normal, ordinary, but not the resurrection. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while it was still dark in order to pay her respects and to accept the reality of his death. The other Gospels suggest that the women came early after the Sabbath rest in order to complete the embalming process. But one thing is sure, when they came, they expected to find a body. Surely memories of better days must have flooded Mary's mind as she made her way down the dark road to the tomb. Jesus had made such a stir in Galilee, had attracted crowds who wanted to hear his teaching and marvel at his healing and be embraced by his warmth. Hope had taken root in her heart. Now, no one knew exactly what to expect uh, from Jesus. He kept them off guard a bit, but they all had higher hopes for him than that he would be crucified as a traitor to Rome and a blasphemer to the Jews. The idea that some have that the resurrection was simply a, a projection of human longing, of a human longing to extend our lives beyond the grave, a, a manifestation of the disciples' wishes perhaps, really has no place in scripture. Resurrection was a totally unexpected happening, which they did not grasp immediately. If human projection was all that it was, the disciples surely would have projected a risen Lord who was more comforting and less demanding and difficult than the God we actually experience in the Bible. Mary expected Jesus to be dead. So when she found the tomb opened and the body gone, she came up with what was to her a perfectly rational explanation. They've stolen her body, and she's horrified by this thought, and so she goes running off to tell Peter and John. Have you noticed there's an awful lot of running back and forth in, these, in this story of, uh, of the gospel, and John's account of it especially? And you see, that's what we disciples do when Jesus is missing, and we find ourselves overwhelmed and confused. We do an awful lot of running sometimes simply in circles. So Peter and John come running back. And they peer into the tomb and they see the grave clothes and the text says simply, they believe. But what is it that they really believe? It certainly wasn't that Jesus had been raised for in the very next story, we find them behind closed doors, confused, even terrified. What they believed, apparently, was simply what Mary had told them, that the body was, uh, was stolen, the tomb was empty, and someone must have come and taken the body. And so what do they do? They go back home, they settle in, they figure it's all over. And they leave Mary behind, deep in grief, crying. Such sensitive guys, aren't they? So tuned in to Mary's emotional needs, right? I don't think so. You know, to some it might be surprising that all four Gospels report that it is women who first come to the tomb, women who first get the resurrection. But to maybe as many as half of the people here, maybe it's not all that surprising that the men seem to be clueless when it comes to spiritual and relational matters. Peter and John go home, they hunker down, they open up a beer and turn on the game. <laughs> and Mary's left behind, still weeping. Mary holds back, hangs on, hopes to make sense of these events. 
She looks into the tomb, and when the angels ask her why is she still weeping, she doesn't budge from her explanation. They've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. And so she asks help of the man that she supposes is the gardener. You know, if you have carried him away, just tell me, and I'll come and, and get him. Now, I sort of wondered here as I read this passage, what in the world is she going to do? You know, she sling the body of Jesus over her shoulder and bring him back for another reburial? Jesus reveals himself to her, calling her by name Mary, and she immediately recognizes his voice, and so she calls him by the name that she knew him best, Rabboni, you know, rabbi, teacher. I like that picture of Mary lingering, sticking with it, not abandoning the effort to understand. It's not easy to make sense of the truth that Jesus has come back, is alive, is calling us onward. Peter and John, not getting it, quickly move on, but Mary can't let it go. She has to figure it out, make sense of what doesn't seem to make any sense. She doesn't rush on when what is required is hanging on, sticking with it, being patient. She does what we who expect immediacy in all things so often fail to do. She is willing to wait. I recently read that millennials, millennials expect a response from a company that they may email within 20 minutes or else they'll just turn elsewhere, go to the next one. We expect our answers and we expect them right now. We're impatient in matters of faith when wisdom which can sustain us doesn't always come that quickly. My favorite book of the British apologist C.S. Lewis is The Great Divorce. The imaginative, his imaginative narrative of disciples who are on their way to heaven. And so in this little novelette, he pictures these heaven-bound people all standing in line waiting for a bus to carry them to heaven. But some people get impatient with all this waiting, and, and they begin to argue among themselves. First, they argue about, well, do you think there really is a bus? Maybe there isn't a bus that's going to come. And then they wonder about the destination. You know, is, is heaven, is, is it really worthwhile? Or is it really even real? And then they, they wonder if they'll be able to stand the kind of people that are in line going, I, I don't know whether I really like these people. Do I really want to go to this place? And on and on. And one waspish woman declared out of her impatience with having to wait, well then, I just won't go at all. So there. She didn't need this. And she walks away in the novel from the bus line as if her turning her back on it settled the truth of the matter. Important things require a certain effort, a definite persistence. Malcolm Gladwell, in his best-selling book, Outliers, observed that as a rule of thumb, 10,000 hours of practice are necessary for mastering important skills, like throwing a curveball, or learning Chinese cooking, or playing the piano. But could the same be said as well for being a disciple? that it requires practice. With important matters like discipleship or coming to understand what difference the resurrection makes, the, the quick fix, the once over lightly, simply doesn't work. Oh, I've prayed about that a couple of times and nothing happened. I, I read the Bible every once in a while. I've gone to church occasionally, but life didn't turn out as I expected it. So there, I need not bother getting on the bus. I was deeply impressed by a woman in a named Jean in a congregation I served some years ago who told me about a friend of hers who asked her to pray for, for her husband who was dealing with a serious gambling addiction which was ruining their family. And for the next 17 years, Jean said, she prayed about this on a daily basis. And thankfully the man eventually began going to Gamblers Anonymous and began dealing with his problem. But I suspect that Jean would have prayed for 17 more years even if he hadn't. Mary Magdalene held back. She waited. She tried to make sense. And she encountered the risen Lord. And nothing was the same. But what Jesus says then next is, is uh, baffling and, and a little unsettling, I think. Do not hold on to me, he says. 
Now, there's no evidence, is there, that Mary was trying to hang on to him, at least physically, but maybe her clinging was of another kind, wanting to hold on to the life with Jesus that she had known before, seeing him heal and teach and, and be a shoulder to lie on. Mary is the first person in Scripture that really has to come to grips with the realization that Jesus can't be touched. He, he can't be held on to now. His resurrection wasn't resuscitation to the old life. He was moving on. He, he says, I'm prepared to meet you here in Galilee and eventually ascending to our God and your God. Resurrection is not simply restoring the old Jesus. It's not simply an add-on to what we already know. It's, it is a transformation to something fresh. It's an invitation to the new life of Christ that is out there before us. Mary is getting the word and beginning to understand that there is actually death involved in this new life. She couldn't go back to knowing the old Jesus in the flesh. His death was real. Earlier in John, Jesus uses an analogy. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, then it bears much fruit. You see, there is a rhythm in the Christian life which involves dying to old ways, letting go of the things that hold us back, even old ways of thinking about God so that we can rise to a new life. We cannot cling to the hope that Jesus will take us back to the way it was. The way, the only way out of darkness is by moving ahead. That is what the risen Lord tells the distraught Mary and us. Why are you still weeping, Mary, when you will have to give up your grieving of the past in order to embrace this new order of life? Letting go is never easy. Whether it is letting go of a long-standing hurt or an outmoded way of doing business, or an unhealthy pattern of living, or an illusion that money will buy happiness, or a disposition towards self-centeredness, or a laziness in our patterns of worship and prayer. And especially difficult is sometimes letting go of some of our ideas about God. Maybe ideas about God which try to limit God's grace, the expansiveness of God's grace, or, or assumptions that we make that God's chief end must be to make our life go smoothly, or attitudes that God answering prayer means that God will answer prayer as we think it should be answered. A few years ago, a couple told me that the time had come for them to get back to church. They had been nursing a, a hurt that had happened in church many years before, which had stopped them from coming anymore. How long ago was that, I asked. Well, 30 years, they said. And they said they, for a long time, they had been convinced that God endorsed their hurt, that God really sort of allowed them to be hanging on to their inability to forgive because by golly surely God knows that we are justified in our feeling wounded and in our ongoing feelings of bitterness but finally they said and it took them 30 years finally they realized they had to let go to let it die the idea that God endorses our ongoing feelings of hurts they had to let go and let God heal. Some of you have had to get used to a new normal, sometimes by choice, but most often by circumstances beyond your control. Your children have moved away, your mother is showing signs of dementia, your spouse has died, the job you once loved has been eliminated. How we wish we could go back to what it once was. But Jesus says, even in the darkness, the only way is ahead. Mary discovered that following Jesus is a never-ending process of letting go. Insofar as we think we've, we've begun to capture Jesus, we've got him figured out, we've got him nailed down, we have simply pushed him back into the tomb. But Jesus just won't stay there. 
he keeps showing himself in new and ever unexpected ways. The, e the question that Easter really asks of us is not do we believe in the doctrine of the resurrection. Doctrines are easy to bend so somehow they will conform to our desires. Before long, we can reduce resurrection to sentimental ideas about new beginnings and, or pro forma thoughts about life everlasting. The Gospels don't really ask, do you believe? But rather, have you encountered the risen Christ? After resurrection, things do not return to normal. And that's good news. Mary was surely changed, and so is every one of us who is confident, not in our ability to hang on to Jesus, but rather on Jesus' ability to hang on to us, knowing that we are ready for anything. Central to this Easter message, of course, is the conviction that because Jesus conquered death, so too may we conquer death. But this is more than an end of life thing. It's more than saving souls for heaven one by one. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright puts it well. The message of Easter is not simply Christ has risen. Now it's all set for you. You know, whatever happens beyond the grave, you're, you know, you're fixed. You're set. No, no. Wright suggests that the, uh, the Easter message is even more fundamentally Christ is risen. Now, get moving. We can't cling. We can't try to push him back into comfortable, settled ways. Moving into the future with the risen Christ may require us to give up old attitudes, old habits, old ways. Jesus invites us to live now with an eye to what he was promising long term for the future. The New Testament view of resurrection tells us that what we do in the present feeding the hungry, tending the sick, seeking justice, housing the homeless, sharing good news of grace and forgiveness, that these things that we are instructed to do now will last into God's future. Easter declares to us that Christ is out there, on the loose, building his kingdom, pushing back the darkness, creating new life. Christ is risen, so get moving, and life will never be the same. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It is now our privilege to go before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, because we are not strong enough to pray as we should, you provide Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit to intercede for us in power. In this confidence, we ask you to accept our prayers. Let us take a few moments of silence to pray for the church. Faithful God, you formed your church from the despised of the earth and showed them mercy, that they might proclaim your salvation to all. Strengthen all those who are part of your church today, that they may faithfully face all that comes their way, all the ways in which you build us up into the church, the body of Christ. Let us take a few moments of silence to pray for creation. Creator of all, you entrusted the earth to the human race, yet we disrupt its peace with violence and corrupt its purity with our greed. Prevent your people from ravaging creation that coming generations may inherit lands brimming with life. Let us take a few moments of silence to pray for the world. Sovereign God, you hold both the, the history of nations and the humble life of villages in your care. 
Preserve the people of every nation from tyrants, heal them of disease, and protect them in the time of upheaval and disaster, that, they, that all may enter the kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us take a few moments of silence to pray for peace. Judge of the nations, you created humanity for salvation and not for destruction. And you sent your son to guide us into the way of peace. Enable people of every race and nation to accept each other as sisters and brothers, your children, on whom you lavish honor and favor. Let us take a few moments of silence to pray for this community. Merciful God, since Jesus longed to protect Jerusalem as a hen gathers her young under her wings, we ask you to guard and strengthen all who live and work here. Deliver your people from jealousy and contempt that they may show mercy to all their neighbors. Let us take a few moments of silence to pray for all families and for those who live alone. Holy God, from whom every family on earth takes its name, strengthen parents to be responsible and loving, that their children may know security and joy. Lead children to honor parents by compassion and forgiveness. May all people discover your parental care by the respect and love given them by others. Let us take a few moments of silence to pray for all who suffer any sorrow or trial, remembering especially this day those who are in rehab, Jean Lamastra, and the family and friends of Will Ambrose, who passed away. Compassionate God, your son gives rest to those weary with heavy burdens. Heal the sick in body, mind, and spirit. Lift up the depressed. Befriend those who grieve, comfort the anxious. Stand with all victims of abuse or other crimes. Awaken those who damage themselves and others through the use of any drug. Fill all people with your Holy Spirit, that they may bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let us take a few moments of silence to give thanks for the lives of the departed who now have rest in God. Eternal God, your love is stronger than death and your passion more fierce than the grave. We rejoice in the lives of those whom you have drawn into your eternal embrace. Keep us in joyful communion with them until we join the saints of every people and every nation, gathered before your throne in ceaseless praise. God of glory, you see how all creation groans in labor as it awaits redemption. As we work for and await your new creation, we trust that you will answer our prayers with grace and fulfill your promise that all things work together for good for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
remembering the words of our Lord Jesus, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Please be seated.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, God of all creation. It is through your goodness that we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Amen. Thank you. 